everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Peggy Lee, and I'm the director of chapters here at the American Constitution Society, the nation's foremost progressive legal organization with over 240 student and lawyer chapters across the country. This year, ACS is celebrating 20 years of shaping national legal debates, nurturing the next generation of leaders, lawyers, judges, and advocates, and ensuring that the laws are forced to improve the lives of all people. You can find us online at acslaw.org, where you can become a member and find out more information about upcoming events and programs. Today is also a really great day to join ACS or renew your membership. All new or renewed memberships will last through the end of December 2022, and you can join using the link in the chat box. We are really excited to bring you today's program and really excited um, with the high number of RSVPs and the interest in working in a state attorney's general office for the summer and beyond. So today moderating our call is Senior Director of Network Advancement, Valerie Manry. Before joining ACS in 2019, Valerie was an Assistant Attorney General in the Office of the Attorney General for the District of Columbia, where her practice focused on federal affirmative civil litigation of constitutional and administrative law issues. She now leads ACS's State Attorney's General Project. So I'll turn things over to Valerie and she'll tell you a little more about the State AG Project and introduce our speakers. Thank you, Peggy. Um, as many of you know, State Attorneys General are the state's chief legal officers. They are sworn to uphold the US and state constitutions and to enforce federal and state laws. The heart of a State Attorney General's mission is to serve the public interest. In 2017, ACS launched the State Attorneys General Project to develop and disseminate legal resources and host programming and events examining the actions of State Attorneys General and the emerging legal and policy issues they face. The State AG Project also highlights opportunities for law students and attorneys to advance their careers in public service in state attorney general offices. If you hear me see, say state AGOs, that's what I mean, state attorney general offices. Based on a suggestion by a student chapter leader last year, um, we developed and started publishing state AG employment opportunities resources that provide information about summer and postgraduate opportunities in state AGOs. We update these resources regularly and post them on our website, and you can find them at the link in the chat box. Um, I have just a few housekeeping notes before I introduce our special guest today. Today's event is being recorded, and the recording will be available on ACS's website at www.acslaw.org. Um, second, we will be taking some questions from listeners and viewers, and we will incorporate them into the discussion throughout. So there's no need to wait until the end to ask questions. If you would like to ask a question, you can type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen at any time. We ask that you not put them in the chat box because we may not necessarily see them. Um, and we will try to get to as many questions as possible. If you are joining by phone and would like to ask a question, please email it to LCE mail. So LC email at acslaw.org. Um, now I am pleased to introduce our speakers for today. Originally from Knoxville, Tennessee, Tate Ball attended college at UCLA before returning home to attend the University of Tennessee School of Law, where he received his JD in 2019. While in law school, he served as president of his ACS student chapter. He currently serves as an assistant attorney general in the Tennessee Attorney General's office, where he works on antitrust and consumer protection matters and addresses the unauthorized practice of law in Tennessee. His work ranges from addressing consumer fraud by Tennessee companies to antitrust claims against big tech companies in multi-state litigation. He also researches and monitors data privacy and cryptocurrency issues to protect consumers in Tennessee. Christine Jones Brady, or CJ Brady, serves as the second assistant attorney general of Nevada. In this capacity, she oversees the Criminal Prosecutions Unit, Bureau of Consumer Protection, Investigations, Medicaid Fraud, and the Post-Conviction Unit, Improving Criminal Justice Response Rural Prosecutor Grant Program, 
wrongful, sorry, wrongful conviction compensation program and the conviction integrity unit. That is a lot. Prior to joining the Nevada Attorney General's office, she practiced law for 10 years at the Washoe County Public Defender's Office. A graduate of the William S. Boyd School of Law at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, CJ earned both a BA in political science and an MA in sociology from Stanford University. She has also participated in several statewide boards and commissions, including the Advisory Commission for the Administration of Justice and the Attorney General's Domestic Violence Council. And last but not least, Karen Mishuli is the Director of Legal Talent for the Colorado Attorney General's Office. She has 17 years of experience as a talent expert and is adept at strategic hiring and recruiting, coaching and teaching professional development and skills topics for attorneys and law students, and pushing forward innovative ideas related to diversity, inclusion, and retention in the legal profession. Before joining the Attorney General's Office, Karen was the Director of Legal I'm sorry, Director of Talent Analytics and Coaching for Diversity Labs on-ramp fellowship, where she used data analytics and behavioral interviews to assess candidates for a re-entry platform that matches experienced lawyers returning to the workforce after a career hiatus with large law firms and legal departments. She also has a decade of experience counseling legal professionals on career navigation, job search strategies, application materials, interview techniques, and salary negotiations. Originally from Princeton, New Jersey, Karen received an AB from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and a law degree from the University of Colorado Law School. Welcome to all of our speakers. We are so glad you could be with us today. And starting with Tate, I would love it if each of you would tell us a little more about your background, your work in your AG's office, and why you went to work in a state AG's office. So Tate, take it away. All right, thanks. Um... Well, a little bit about my background. Uh, before I went to UCLA, I did some uh, acting in California for two years. Um, so that's what got me out there. And uh, sort of what got me interested in the law was while I was at UCLA, um, there was this uh, group we started called the Root Strikers, which was uh, about campaign finance reform. And so that got me into um, you know big money being involved in our politics and corporate interest uh, shaping the way that our legislation is made. Um, so that got me into uh, to law school or made me steered me in that direction. I uh, came back home, uh, got a little more bang for my buck. Uh, going to UT for three years would be less expensive than going to UCLA for one. So um, came back home um, and uh, you know took some antitrust classes since that sort of uh, anti-corporate zeal was still part of me. And uh, during my third year, my 3L year, I uh, did a semester in residence program with the attorney general's office. Uh, and their consumer protection division. Um, really enjoyed it. Uh, so I applied and um, about the time I was taking the bar, I found out that they had hired me and um, I've been here for about two, two years and two months now. So it's been a great experience so far. Um, you know, I've been mostly focused on the Facebook and Google antitrust matters. Those take up a lot of my time. Um, but in, that's the kind of experience I would not be able to get uh, in any um, you know, private firm or uh, working on my own. Um, it's the kind of litigation experience that only you can get in a government position. So it's been a great experience so far. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tate. CJ, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your background, how you wound up at a state AGO, what you do there? Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here. So this is law was being a lawyer is my second career. I, when I graduated from uh, Stanford back in, I don't, won't say the <laughs> long time ago. In fact, I think we were coming up to our 35th anniversary this year. Uh, um, I, I actually went to work for the Government Accountability Office, the GAO, and I learned, um, I was a program evaluator. So we would travel across the country and evaluate different, um, the efficacy of different kinds of uh, uh, programs, how programs were spending Congress's money basically. So we would, we would evaluate any program funded by Congress. And so that was, that was really good and interesting. Um, my father got ill I, and so I moved back to Nevada. 
uh, Las Vegas at the time. So I moved back to Las Vegas to help out with my dad. And then I ended up for about another, uh, I'd say seven or eight years working for a community action agency, advocating for low income people uh, who are struggling. Um, so the community action agency had programs such as Head Start, child care assistance, which is most of you all know is a huge issue right now. Uh, WIC health programs back then, uh, HIV was, um, was uh, they didn't have a lot of treatment for HIV yet. So I also worked with children who were HIV positive at birth and I helped, uh, we had a daycare that worked with those kids. And so a lot of different things, but basically, and, and it was located in the heart of the West Las Vegas, which is known as the black community in West Las Vegas. And um, I worked with getting to know the community and I loved working with the community. And as I was working with them, I realized there were a lot of civil rights issues, a lot of criminal justice issues, things that people in the community were dealing with. And that's when I decided to go to law school and I went to Boyd and um, with the intent of doing civil rights law. But once I uh, got involved with the juvenile justice clinic and defending juveniles, and then I externed at the uh, federal public defender's office and I interned there. And then after graduation, I clerked for a state court judge for a while. And then I worked for the Washoe County Public Defender, working with clients and all their issues. So anyone who's interested in being public, a public defender, that is as close to being a social worker as you can get while still being an attorney. My mother was a social worker and told me never to be a social worker. And so I got her, I became a public defender. Um, and then when Attorney General Aaron Ford got elected as Nevada's first African-American constitutional officer, and he, I met with him, I served on a committee with him. <clears throat> I had a big mouth. He, uh, he uh, his chief of staff reached out to me one day and said, Attorney General Ford, uh, uh, what do you call it when before when they're elected, but they haven't gone on board yet. There's a word for it. I can't think of it right now. But she said, Attorney General Ford elect would like to meet with you. And I thought he was just going to meet to talk about committee stuff. And so we were talking about criminal justice reform and criminal justice reform is one of his top values and missions for the office, along with consumer protection, along with civil rights, along with, you know, client uh, communication and client services. And so uh, I was just, we were just talking about criminal justice reform. And then at the end of the, the lunch, uh, he and his chief of staff said, well, you know, we hate to ambush you, but this was really an interview. And so he offered me the position of, of a second assistant. He said he wanted someone who came from a public defender background to work with his prosecution division and work with him on uh, criminal justice policy. And I just, I couldn't pass it up, working for uh, an amazing AG. And I really, honestly, and we can talk about this later, I did not know all the different stuff that AG offices did until I got here. So the job has ended up being even more than I, um, even more than I anticipated. And it's, I hope that people that are watching this think about working for their, um, an AG office. It's fabulous. Thank you so much, CJ. I had the same experience when I went to work at a state AGO. I had no idea how much they did. Um, and uh, Karen, turning to you and your background, how did you wind up at a state AGO? Um, yeah. Why? So I could honestly say that I am in my dream job. Um, this is this is fantastic. So I'll, I'll tell you briefly how I got there. Um, in law school, my most favorite classes were the clinical ones where I had an opportunity to actually work with people and help them. And I kept thinking, this is the kind of thing I want to do. Um, simultaneously, I loved being in school and I loved working with students. And so out of law school, um, while I while I was simultaneously doing some legal work for Colorado Legal Services, I decided to take a position at the law school. 
And so it was, it was sort of risky in the sense that a lot of people were like, you know, do you know what you're doing? Maybe you're tanking your career, you know? And I said, but I, this is what I really want to do. And I'm really happy doing it, but it also meant starting at the bottom. And so the first position I got at the law school was sort of answering the phone and managing appointments. And then very quickly it became career counseling. And then very, you know, a couple of years after that, I was a director in the office um, and then running the externship program. And so, you know, it takes time to get to where you want to go, but it was well worth it. So our current attorney general, 10 or seven years ago ish was the Dean of the law school that I was working at. So at the university of Colorado, he served as the Dean for five years. And so I had the opportunity to work with him on a number of high level projects and a lot of data driven projects. Um, and so we work really well together. Um, and then out of the law school, I, I took a position where I was working more on diversity, equity, and inclusion and big law. Um, but, just a couple of years ago, he gave me a call and said, hey, you know, we've got this position and um, and I think you'd be great at filling it. So it, to me, that goes to show too the networking aspect of finding that next step. It's really important. And in that sense, you know, when I was working for him, I didn't think, well, eventually he's going to be, a, you know, AG and I'll have an opportunity to work there. But um, I think what wherever you're at, whatever level you're at, do really good work for the people that you're working for, and you'll leave a really good impression. Um, so the neat thing about my job now is that it did not exist until our attorney general came on and created it. So we didn't have anybody who was like, we have committees that were thinking about our internship program and we're thinking about our fellowship program and, and we're hiring individually for their sections, but we didn't have one person sort of tasked with looking at the high level approach to how we recruit as an office. So that's what I get to do. Um, and it's a ton of fun. I get to be to be the human. I think a lot of times um, at, at state AG's offices, we can sort of seem like, where do, where do you start to get the inside scoop about what's going on there, about how to apply or, um, you know, say I, say I might know Tate, but I really wanna work in another section. Like, how do I, you know, where, where do I start? Um, and, and when I send my application in, where is it really going? And is it going to the right place? So I get to create the structure around that at my office um, and it's a lot of fun. And so I look forward to, to hearing from those who, who are interested in generally in state AG's offices or, or certainly in coming to work for ours. Thank you so much, Karen. <laughs> um, I know several people in the audience have those questions, you know, how does one obtain a law clerk position in a state AGO? Uh, you know, where, where do you find these positions? Um, do state AG offices uh, participate in on campus or from where I went on grounds interviews? Um, and like, what does the timeline look like for specifically for summer hiring? I think um, if we can focus on um, just like summer and semester externships, um, like how does what does that process look like? And I'll and I'll start with Karen. Yeah, so this is going to certainly be different from office to office, um, but for for our office right now, and this might be similar. And um, CJ and Tate, feel free to weigh in, but we are certainly beginning to collect applications now for next summer. Um, and we kind of work on a rolling basis. We have nine sections. And so when we receive those applications, based on what the student is interested in, we're then farming them out to each section. So there's slightly different timelines with each section, but generally, if you were to go to our website, um, and, I, and I bet CJ and Tate could say the same, we have a section on our website that specifically has the information on how to apply um, where to send your application materials, et cetera. But my advice too would be to find one human in an office to, um, to be able to just sort of make sure that you're doing it the right way. Um, and that if you don't hear anything that you've got someone to follow up with to say like, hey, you know, I think I, I haven't heard anything. I guess that means I didn't get the position. And we all know that that's not necessarily true. It's just sometimes it takes us a while. Um, so I do, you know, I think it's, um, you can find the information on the website, but always good to, to have a human as well, to advocate for you and to answer questions. 
CJ or Tate, would you like to chime in? Well, I was scrambling to see if we had it on our website, our process, and I haven't found it yet, but our process is very similar to what uh, Karen described. And the our um, program is led by Leslie Nino Piro, but if you, you, Valerie, you can either give them her information or my information if they're interested in applying here. We're also, we are also on a rolling basis. We do offer internships throughout the year. Our summer internship is probably our best one because that's where we actually have a big class and other people and activities and things for people to participate in. But again, we still accept people all uh, across the year. So uh, it's a great experience. So. Uh, join us and this year because of covid we had a hybrid of virtual and in person and ours is very similar in that we do a rolling basis as well and our summer clerkships uh, are divided you spend half you rank your list of choices based on division or section that you're interested in and then you spend half of the summer in one and half in the other and you can still get intersectional work um, assignments from uh, different divisions uh, but it's a good way for you to figure out, you know, what you want to do after law school, because um, we have a wide range of opportunities from criminal to civil to, you know, transactional revenue stuff, uh, tax division, um, or antitrust work like, like I do, and I would recommend that. But um, what I did was the semester in residence program, and it was part of my last semester in law school, so I got it as part of a, uh, as course credit uh, as well, but um, unlike doing the summer clerkship uh, where you have a larger class. I came with uh, about six students from Knoxville to Nashville, uh, moved here um, by myself, didn't really know anybody except for the one other person from Tennessee that was in the AG's office. Uh, so that was a little more difficult. So I, I think I would probably recommend the, the summer clerkship, although I did, did have a great time uh, during my semester in residence. Um, there's probably more structure there built in for the summer clerkship program. And uh, another way to reach out is also to look at who is doing running the HR or talent departments for your uh, for the office that you're interested in because they will be able to give you more direct feedback about what opportunities are currently available um, and what kind of things you might be able to do to um, bring your transcript to the top of, of their pile. I've, I've got another point as well. So uh, CJ, you mentioned a hybrid. I think going forward, we learned a lot from the hybrid experience. And actually, I guess, for the last two summers, we weren't hybrid at all. We were just straight up remote. Um, but I think going forward, we see the ability to attract more candidates by having remote options for working in our office. So if you were interested, um, and I would check with other states that you might be interested in, but don't assume that you have to move somewhere for the summer in order to come intern now, because we're, we're kind of equipped to make it happen remotely. And to find we spent a lot of time really thinking about ways that we were gonna focus on integrating our students that were remote so that they're not getting a, you know, a shorter experience, if you will. Um, and I was also gonna say with respect to the sections and this hit me when Tate was talking about the different sections to potentially work in, as I mentioned before, when you apply to our office, you might indicate in your cover letter which sections you're interested in. But if I were you, I'd cast a really broad net because there's a lot of areas that as a student you just don't know about. Or if you read it on the website, you might go, I don't really even understand exactly what that section does. So I'm just going to leave that one off my list because um, it looks confusing and I'm not going to do it. I would go for it. I would cast a broader net. Like if you know for sure, like, hey, criminal is not going to be my thing, fine. You can take those two sections off your list. But think broadly. Um, we have a lot of sections in our office. Actually, the majority of our sections in our office do litigation, um, but when you read them, when you read the section that says revenue and utilities or business and licensing, you're like, oh, those sound, I don't know, I want to do litigation. So then we find students apply to our civil litigation section, which is great, but we get a ton of applications for that and really low number of applications for the other sections. Um, when you would get an equally fantastic experience in those other sections, at this point, you want to you want to build your skill set. So it really doesn't matter where you go. You're going to get a great experience and you may go, great, I worked in the tax unit this summer and it 
it solidified my uh, my realization that I don't want to be a tax lawyer. That's great, but you still have that on your resume, and you still got great experience. Um, and in our office, our tax lawyers and those people that work in revenue and utilities are some of the best mentors and smartest lawyers that we have. Um, so cast a broad net. Don't assume you know what you want to do yet. Go for it. Um, and some of us on the inside can tell you where you might, uh, where we get fewer applications, which kind of helps because they can be a little bit less competitive too. Those are some excellent tips. Um, and it definitely picks up on a thread I wanted that uh, CJ mentioned in her um, background section, which is, you know, um, many people do not know all of the things that state attorneys general do. Um, so I was wondering if, um, each of you could just give some um, thoughts about areas where progressive lawyers, law students um, can work in state AGOs, like beyond the obvious, right? So consumer protection and, um, you know, protecting homeowners and even antitrust work um, or doing, um, you know, elder justice, like those definitely uh, jump out as um, progressive work. But I think that there are a lot of areas, like Karen said, where there is a need for law students and lawyers to come work, but also where people might not necessarily think of it. So... I'd love to hear more thoughts on other areas in CAGOs where state, uh, law students and lawyers can look. I'll just jump in quickly. So a couple of hot topics at our office that students may not know that we work on. We have, um, we have a unit that works and advises the marijuana enforcement division. So um, this is part of our marijuana liquor and bankruptcy unit, which is in our revenue and utility section. So one of those sections where, again, you might go, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. But um, the work is incredibly exciting for us as Colorado. Um, there's a lot of work for us to do on the marijuana side of things. Um, so and we're sort of front runners in the country on that. So really exciting work to be a part of. Um, our insurance unit in, in our business and licensing section is working on healthcare policy and, um, you know, really helping on big insurance decisions, which ultimately are going to affect, um, you know, the way insurance health insurance is across the country and affects people nationally. So, you know, you might go insurance. Ah, it's actually really exciting um, and up and coming. And the, the lawyers that get to work in that unit um, are really doing cutting edge work. Um, that's really exciting. I'm trying to think if there's another area uh, that's sort of unique to our state. You know, we recently got a lot of national news for working on the um, Elijah McLean case. So Students that work in our office were helping with, you know, um, the investigation around that. And this is, again, um, will really begin to set precedent for how these cases involving law enforcement go in, you know, nationally. So, I mean, you, you name it, you can get involved with it. The work is really exciting at all of our offices. I, I think just to piggyback off of what Karen said, uh, I, those two, the marijuana and the health, those are excellent. Um, I would have said those same, same things. And here in Nevada, we recently have decriminalized and recreationalized marijuana. And we're in the process of creating that system of accountability for dispensaries, as well as safety for kids. Um, you know, exposure of marijuana to, to children. So great area to be in. But as if you are progressive thinking, I think that you can bring that energy wherever to whatever area you work in. And I encourage you to do it. For example, with prosecutions, I've always thought being me being progressive, that defense work was more where I felt comfortable. And I did enjoy working with clients um, and helping them. That's a, a great feeling when you help someone. Horrible feeling when they tank, but great feeling when you're able to help someone. Uh, as a prosecutor though, you can really do a lot 
to make the system more just and better for everyone. And there's a lot of power in being a prosecutor. You make decisions, charging decisions, you know, you, you decide to offer things or not for negotiations. And um, A.G. Ford, when I first came on board, I worked with him and we had a whole criminal justice reform memo where we worked with our chief prosecutor and all the other prosecutors to not gratuitously charge people, you know, because um, every crime that someone commits or offense, you could probably think of 10 different crimes that could fit there. And so we're not gratuitously charging, uh, maybe, you know, not uh filing for the death penalty if we have a murder case in the prison. There's just so many different ways that you can as a prosecutor. Uh, I will not take a, a Tate's thunder, but consumer protection, I had never thought of that really until I came to the AG's office. But when they pitched it to me, and, and just so that you know, I work with each of these divisions and Honestly, a lot of my job is policy and personnel, um, but the criminal justice, um, the chief prosecutor, he's put me on a couple cases just to keep me fresh. So I have been second chairing it just so also so that I know what it really is to be a prosecutor. Right. So I've prosecuted um, several cases prosecuting a murder case right now, uh, second chairing. Uh, but but our consumer protection division, I can't wait till Tate talks about that, that once I got here and realized just the expanse of that, um, if you want to be, if you want to prosecute things and prosecute the bad guy and the big guy, uh, that's where a lot of the action is. Um, the other thing is just in general, the day-to-day -day in all the areas. So on the civil side of our office, we represent each state division. So like the Nevada Department of Corrections, the Nevada Department of Public Safety, the Gaming Control Board, all of these different entities, our lawyers um, within the AG's office advise those agencies. And as a progressive, you can have a lot of influence over what advice you give your clients. So at the NDOC, you could advise your client I would, no one would ever advise this, but you know, yeah, put everybody in isolation who acts up or you can advise them. Let's work towards getting programs and services. Like, so again, there's, you can bring yourself to wherever, um, to wherever you are. So I'd like to echo what uh, Karen and CJ are both saying about how you can bring your progressive spirit to any division you're working in. Um, but as my experience is solely with the consumer protection and antitrust division, I'll talk more about the stuff that we get to do. Um, you know, Tennessee, uh, like Nashville, is sort of a blue dot in a, in a widely red sea. Um, the consumer protection division is, is similarly more of a one of our bluer dots in the AG's office. Um, but even though that's the case, uh, we can see eye to eye on things um, such as consumer protection. I remember during my interview with the attorney general. One thing that struck me that he said was uh, Tennessee's not a pro-business state, we're a pro-good business state. Um, and so consumer protection, a lot of the stuff we do is make sure people are practicing good business and not defrauding or unfairly treating consumers. Um, and that includes uh, targeting, uh, you know, the elderly, targeting vulnerable veterans um, with fraudulent schemes or um, you know, pyramid schemes, uh, all sorts of things. Um, and that's one thing that the Consumer Protection Division is so cool about is there's such a wide variety of casework. Um, you know, one, one thing that I do, uh, I specialize in leading a multi-state and predatory leasing cases. We've got three companies across the United States that have these uh, schemes where they're selling products. And um, when someone doesn't qualify for the subprime uh, credit loan, um, instead of uh, giving them a credit transaction, um, there are these leasing companies that sort of disguise themselves as credits, credit sales, uh, and they end up um, charging people two to three times what the cash price is. And, you know, they're targeting people that are, um, you know, the society's most vulnerable, the ones that don't qualify for the, the, um, the, the lowest credit uh, score uh, point. Um, so 
you know, these aren't the most sophisticated parties and they are vulnerable and end up having to pay more than they can possibly pay. And they have their uh, bank accounts automatically debited from. And that's just one of the many instances where um, being a consumer protection attorney really allows me to stick up for the little guy and put my, um, you know, progressive feelings in action uh, to try to get some money and get some um, payments back to consumers when they've been unfairly treated or money's been taken from them. Um, and antitrust is, is quite similar to that. Although you're protecting an industry larger, like more so than protecting a specific individual, um, you're protecting the competition within that industry so that consumers are treated fairly in the long run. Um, instead of one company, you know, jacking up the prices once they have a complete monopoly over an entire industry. So that's what my experience has been. Um, I know other divisions, uh, there's plenty of progressives and other divisions as well here. Um, and, and like you said, uh, don't always assume that something like tax is going to be very bookish because uh, one of my closest friends is a tax attorney in our division. And uh, he never took tax in law school, uh, was a litigation track uh, all throughout Tennessee. And um, he loves it. He says it's just pure litigation. The cases just get brought to you and you get to litigate. Um, so yeah, like uh, Karen said, um, find out more about the divisions that aren't uh, as often applied to and uh, see if that's something you're interested in. Thank you so much, Tate. I wanted to offer a, another example um, from another state AG uh, who I spoke with who said he was looking for somebody to work with their DMV. And it sounded like the most boring job, but he's like, I need a progressive who is going to think about this as you know, facial recognition technology and our database of driver's license photos. Like, how do we handle that? How do we handle gender identity on driver's licenses? These are all progressive ideas that permeate all parts of state government um, that you wouldn't necessarily think of. So thank you all for giving us great examples of work that progressives can do in state AGOs and even not just working for a progressive AG, but working in a red state for a Republican or you know, independent, some other party who's not necessarily progressive, they're still, you can still bring your progressive values. Um, I wanted to ask a couple of questions um, to Tate. One came in on the, on the Q&A and I had one on my list. Um, so this may be multi-part, but um, can you tell us about um, working as a law clerk in a state AGO like what was the toughest part of it and what advice you would give for students who are working as law clerks? Sure. Um, well, in a little bit different than most people that do the summer law clerk experience, I did it during my last semester. So I had to balance coursework as well as um, remote, remote coursework as well as uh, my work in the office. So that was probably the most difficult part for me. Um, but uh, I, I think um, you know, moving to Nashville, meeting new people was a bit of a challenge, but if you're in a uh, the position where you're in the same city, um, I'd say the hardest parts of getting used to an office is learning how the hierarchical bureaucratic um, part of the government, a government job works, um, you know, learning who your supervisors are, um, making sure you know the right people to ask questions, bring questions to, um, and, you know, it's, it's good to, it's good to talk to everybody. Um, I, I remember my first day, some of the best advice I got from my um, supervisor when I was a clerk was to go around the entire floor, uh, introduce myself. This was back before COVID, so you could shake hands and, and all that, um, and ask if they could give me some work, if there's anything that I could help them with. Because uh, while some people might be a little more hesitant to reach out to you and give you work um, directly, once, they've, once you've already done work for them, they'll seek you out uh, if you've done good work. Um, that's what you should always strive to do. Um, so when you put yourself out there, and I, I think that's not just in AG's um, world, but in any job, put yourself out there, ask questions, do good work, um, and uh, hopefully then they'll come back to you and maybe hire you after the end of your clerkship like they did me. So um, did I answer the entire question? <laughs> that's, that's the first part. I'm going to come back to you with another one, but I wanted to see if CJ or Karen wanted to chime in on the advice for law clerks, whether it's during the summer or during a semester clerkship, um, you know, uh, yeah, what advice would you give to law students? 
You're on mute, CJ. <laughs> I would say uh, relationships too. Working on relationships with people and being, um, just getting to know people, the networking. I think that Karen mentioned that earlier, maybe Valerie did, the networking aspect of it. I am, to this day, I keep in touch with all of the interns I've ever had. So um, they will say years, it hasn't been that long. It's only been a couple of years, three years, but you know, they'll put me down as a reference or sometimes they'll just call. Uh, some of them have went to other states to work and when they're in town, we'll have lunch and it's, it's wonderful. And it's been, um, so the relationships and the ongoing mentorship that you can have um, throughout your career with the, your supervising attorney or any attorneys within the office, because you might click better with the attorney next to your supervising attorney. It doesn't, you know, get to know them, go out to coffee or, you know, depending upon the COVID situation and your, you know, but work on a project for them, whatever, but relationships are big. Yeah, following up on that, I think that's a great point. You'll have some mentors or people that you work with in your office who really say, like, oh, I'm so glad you're here and they want to invest in you and, and that works really well. But sometimes you have to drive it a little bit yourself too. And so um, I always tell our students at the beginning of the summer to set out their goals, you know, and if, they, if, if one of their goals is to be um, seeking mentorship or to be connecting with people who do certain kinds of work or that type of thing, then from day one, you want to be reaching out and driving that a little bit. Um, the same goes for getting feedback on your work. It's sort of an unsuccessful summer if you don't exactly know how it went. Like you could have met a lot of great people, but part of it is the work too. And you wanna make sure that with each assignment, you're getting some feedback that you can then apply um, to the next assignment. And so sometimes you have to drive that a little bit and you have to say, hey, you know, I know we didn't touch base on this, but can you give me a, you know, a couple tips or I see you change some things. Can we just talk even for five minutes about what went into you making those changes? Um, I think, I think it's just important to be intentional. Um, and then if you're getting halfway or three quarters to three quarters of the way through the summer and you don't yet have a writing sample, make sure that you either work with your supervisor or other people in your section or however the office is organized and say, Hey, one of my goals for the summer was also to come out with a writing sample. Does anyone have any projects that um, you can give me so that I can finish the summer with that in hand? Because um, I know sometimes students will say things like, hey, I asked around. I asked if anyone else had any work and no one said anything. But sometimes you have to be really specific and say exactly what it is you, you're trying to get at. Or I haven't yet gotten exposure to this kind of work that I know our section is doing. Is there any way that I can get a little bit of that before I finish? These are all really great tips. Go ahead, Tate. Yeah, and just to talk about relationships, um, I'd like to add, in addition to seeking out feedback, which is tremendously important, when you're um, requesting assignments, make sure to request specific deadlines so that you're able to prioritize. And, uh, you know, because sometimes someone will give you an assignment that has a two-week deadline, um, and someone has, you get an assignment later that's got a two-day deadline. And so you're able, if you have those deadlines, you're able to prioritize so that the attorneys don't get mad at you if you don't get it done in time. Um, but yeah, I, th I think that's uh, really good advice to uh, build your relationships. But one thing I have seen clerks do, and this kind of goes to another question that um, uh, we had later on, but um, be friendly, but don't be overly familiar or don't be too um, up in someone's business when they're trying to get work done. Be mindful of um, the attorney's times as you're uh, working with them and uh, they'll appreciate that. And um, I, I think that's something that uh, it's important to keep in mind as you're building these relationships. Again, excellent advice. And I'm going to move on in a minute to postgrad opportunities and 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 lawyers ladder, lateraling into state AGOs. But I had one last uh, summer or semester clerkship question, picking up on something Tate just said, which is. Are there mistakes or if you could identify like one mistake <laughs> that you've seen law clerks make that you uh, would advise law students to avoid? Um, in addition to what I was just saying, another thing would be, um, it, I think it's best when you come in to assume, uh, assume that you don't know anything. Um, it's, you know, uh, 
assume that your supervisor's experience is going to be better. Don't um, assume that you're right about something. We had a clerk that did tremendous work uh, one time, and uh, but the only negative was that he would focus in so hard on what he thought was the right answer, he would fail to address other parts of an issue. Um, and it would uh, also come across as a bit of uh, mansplaining or um, you know, being talked down to. And despite being such a uh, talented researcher and attorney, a future attorney, um, it, it did rub some people in the wrong way. And you know, you don't want to do that at all because these relationships, even if you don't work here, um, these are the people you're going to be working with professionally uh, for years to come. So that's that's some advice I would give. I'll jump in. Along the timing piece that Tate mentioned, as far as making sure you understand when the deadline is, I think it's always helpful to ask, you know, how long do you expect that this will take? Um, the, the person, it's only an estimate, but what's helpful is if you begin to spend more than that you and you're not done yet, that's a good opportunity to check back in with that person and go, hey, I know we talked about this probably being a 10 hour project, you know, I'm on hour nine and it's, I'm not close. Here's what I've been doing. Um, here's the research I've done. Here's where I'm at. Can we touch base? I think that's really useful because um, it's never a good idea to be going down the wrong path as well and to be wasting time. So it's always good to check back in. Um, another piece is making sure you ask questions and really understand what the assignment is. A lot of times, you know, law students, there's a, there's a lot law students don't know, and that's normal. Um, so when you're receiving an assignment and you're, you, you may be taking notes and you're like, yep, I'm totally understanding this. I, I, I know what's happening. And then you go back to your office or you hang up on teams or whatever it is. And you're like, okay, I'm not exactly sure that this is making sense. Um, that's okay. Take some time to formulate what you really think your questions are. Um, and then get that person for another five, 10 minutes and say, Hey, Here's what I do understand. Here's where I'm still a little unclear. So just to make sure I'm not wasting anyone's time, can we follow up on this? Um, I think it's important. And a lot of times people feel a lack of confidence to do that. They're like, well, I'm supposed to know. Tate just told me this. And, you know, he was really clear. And, you know, he was really confident in what he was saying. So I know that I know it was really clear. So I need to go figure this out, but I don't even know where to start. Um, and it's okay to ask those questions. And sometimes, as attorneys, we're not always clear, or we think you're going to find X, but really X doesn't exist and it's all Y and Z. So um, totally okay to be asking questions. And along those lines, advocate for yourself. Uh, I've noticed that some interns are shy about their schedules, for example, and you are balancing your internship uh, maybe not so much if it's a, during the summer, but sometimes people are taking other summer classes, um, but you're balancing your internship with other classes, or maybe you work, or you have other responsibilities, and so you're around the table, and all these attorneys are saying, okay, we're going to have a meeting at this time, and that time, and uh, we had one situation where at the beginning of our, and the in, uh, at the beginning and the end of our internship, we do we meet with A.G. Ford, right? And we talk about what is justice. And so there was this one time there was this intern and we scheduled the meeting and he couldn't make that meeting. It conflicted with something. I can't remember what it was, but I recall it was fairly important. It was important. And so he just didn't show up. He didn't tell anybody. He didn't say. And so when we got there, it was just kind of, in, it came off like he was flaky. And he wasn't flaky, he had something important of which we only learned about after the fact. My point again is speak up, advocate for yourself. If a time doesn't work, let them know in a professional, in a professional way and suggest another time frame. Thank you so much. Tate, I promised I would come back to you. You mentioned at the top about um, the litigation opportunities in the state AG's office. Um, could you speak further about your perspective on that and, um, you know, working in a state, those opportunities in a state AGO versus what you might gain in a private law firm? The person said, I consistently hear that private sector experience, particularly for litigation, is invaluable and that it's wise to go to a big firm after law school before going into public sector work. 
Um, you know, could you share a little bit more of your perspective on that? For sure. Um, and I've got a little bit more insight, uh, even though I haven't worked in a private law firm, my wife has. Um, and she recently transferred to um, Nashville's Metro Attorney's Office. So um, I'd say that um, what you're doing, the nuts and bolts of it is similar. Um, you know, you're um, drafting up our uh, you know, request for information, um, drafting, I guess, well, for us, we do more subpoenas, but you're still doing discovery back and forth, um, request for production, um, interrogatories. Uh, all, you're doing all of that. You're getting in court, you're arguing motions. Um, I would say that the, the real difference is the substance of what you're doing, the, the, the meat and potatoes. Um, you know, my, my wife, she would, she'd get a little frustrated because she was tired of having to litigate um, a homeowners association, something with like a toilet broke down and there was a leak, uh, whereas, you know, my office would be doing um, a multi-million dollar uh, consumer fraud case. <laughs> And it's just, it's, you know, I, I have found it more interesting and she did too. And so that's why she is now working for Metro. Um, you know, you have to be fueled and be passionate about what you're doing, I think. And that's when you do the best work. So if you're, if you're doing cases that are just for billables or, you know, working for insurance defense, um, you're going to get the litigation experience of uh, how to do the, um, you know, X, Y, and Z of practicing law and getting into court. That's, that's, that's all great. But you do get uh, just as much experience doing it for the state attorney's office. You may not have the big firm salaries, um, which are helpful to pay off student loans uh, and you know, invest early in your career. I've, you know, I've heard a lot of clerks bring that up about how they like to invest early and then want to come back and follow a passion project later on in their careers. But um, you know, working for the attorney general's office is experience that you wouldn't get uh, anywhere else. Um, you know, being a two month out of law school, uh, just past the bar and getting assigned to Google and Facebook is not something that I could have gotten anywhere else. Um, and that's experience that uh, I'll be able to talk about in my career going forward. So uh, yeah, that large multi-state litigation experience um, and working with, you know, the FTC, the DOJ, the CFPB on a weekly basis, um, it, it depends on really what you want to do, but I, I think that for me, the substance of what I do uh, is something I could not get out of from. Um, and I think you do learn how to litigate just as well, if not better. Thanks, Tate. Would Karen or CJ have anything to add about the litigation opportunities? All right. Well, then I think I wanted to move on to, um, you know, what are the postgraduate opportunities that are available in your offices. I know that several AG offices do not hire directly out of law school, but there are some who do. Um, so, <laughs> and Tate was raising his hand. Um, so um, let's start with CJ. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what the, the postgraduate work opportunities look like in your office. What does hiring look like? Um, and just get fill in some details. So we, we actually do hire quite a few people right out of law school. Some positions, some of our senior positions obviously need more experienced people. But um, the one thing is I will say our Nevada AG, the state doesn't pay as well as a private firm. Doesn't, won't pay as well as, and in Nevada, since we don't have state income tax, our state attorneys aren't paid as well typically as our county level attorneys. So uh, we have gotten to where we will take in uh, new, newly barred attorneys and train them up. Sometimes they stay, sometimes they leave to go make money other places, but we do spend a lot of time investing in there. Um, one of the entry points for our office is our NDOC division, those that um, litigate uh, pro per uh, 1983 lawsuits uh, for a variety of things, toothpaste, treatment for a broken nose, whatever variety of things. Uh, our criminal justice, we have a couple we'll take uh, we haven't taken for our prosecutors, we usually take someone with at least a few years of experience prosecuting um, our 
post-conviction division, Medicaid fraud, a lot of those we will, uh, some of our just entry-level DAG positions, we do, uh, we do take um, new attorneys. What so. is the um, like timeline for hiring for those positions look like? It depends. It's usually a couple months. You know, we have to post it for, you know, we don't, some of them we don't have to post, but we'll post it for so long. Then we get the applications. Then by the time it's all said and done, it, it takes on our end, it takes a good two months at least. So it's, depending upon when you see the announcement, if you see the announcement right when it comes out, it think that's going to take a little while, at least a month. Thank you. Karen, can you talk about the postgraduate opportunities in uh, Colorado? Yeah, we have a really robust fellowship program um, where we, a year out, uh, we hire 3Ls or people in judicial clerkships to come work at our office to, to really get their start. Um, so it happens to be that the deadline for our program for spots for next fall is tomorrow, um, but that's not too late. I mean, that's like tomorrow at midnight and you can still apply. And so if that's something that someone's interested in, um, go to the website now, it's all of your classic materials and nothing to, you know, um, that would be too difficult for you to, for you to get. If there was something on there that you couldn't, get by tomorrow, just shoot me an email and, um, you know, I'm happy to help you figure that out, but that shouldn't stop you from applying. Um, but I think our program's pretty awesome. We hire about 10 to 15 fellows a year um, to work across the office. So you really have an opportunity to, um, to get a pretty broad range of work. Um, our goal is to hire out of this program. So while we are a state office and in order to fill a vacancy, we have to have a vacancy. Um, you know, we do try to help hire our fellows directly out of that program. Um, and we really see this as an opportunity to get great talent into the office and to train and invest in those in the program. So as a part of our fellows program, we have a trial advocacy certificate program that all of our fellows participate in. So by the time they finish their fellowship, they've got a certificate of, of trial ad, which is sort of a like a, a practical trial ad training. And then they also take a 12 month professionalism course as well as a part of their fellows programming, in addition to all the work that they're doing for the sections in our office. Um, so it's a pretty robust program and we absolutely love our fellows at the office. I'd like to talk to you offline to see if maybe we can implement something like that in Nevada. It sounds like a absolutely. fabulous program. Awesome. Um, Tate, You've already talked to us about the, the hiring Tennessee hires straight um, people straight out of law school and clerkships. Um, it may be helpful for you to pick up uh, on one of the questions uh, from one of our uh, viewers is, you know, what do state AG offices look for in candidates? What should people include in their cover letters? How important are grades? Are there certain courses that law students should have um, in their background? Any information you can give us on that? Sure. Um, you know, we do the rolling applications for 3Ls as well, uh, just to put that out there. But I actually talked to, um, you know, when I was clearing being on here with, uh, with my, my front office, I talked to uh, the head of our HR and she talked about what our office is looking for because I wanted to be able to give you guys the direct information. Um, so, what she told me is that while grades are important, we are also looking for people to get involved. Um, that is to do moot court, to do, um, you know, uh, clerkships, clinics, other jobs, um, just to be more active in the uh, community, do journals. Um, we take all of that into account, uh, but we do put a, a huge amount of emphasis on writing samples um, because what you write is going to represent the office as it's, you know, filed in whichever court uh, you're working in. Um, and so we want that we want the best writers that we can possibly have. Um, and while we do uh, tend to give, you know, a little bit more favoritism towards those that have clerked for us in the past, um, that's not, you know, necessarily a deal breaker. Uh, it's not exclusive to previous clerks. Anybody can come work for us. And I, I know I saw a question about, um, you know, transferring from big law uh, to the state AG's office. And I, you know, I see that happen all the time. Um, we, we have, colleagues, I've only been here for two years, but I've got uh, newer colleagues that are um, 
you know, quite a bit my senior in terms of their legal experience transferring from even New York City uh, uh, to, to work with us. Because, um, you know, the work-life balance that you get in a state AG's office is, is unparalleled to anything you get in a big firm. Um, you get to have your, you know, most, most of your weekdays and most of your weekends, um, you know, to spend time with your family, your friends, to do what you please, uh, while also engaging in a, you know, a robust practice of law. Um, so that's, you know, that's something that I, I don't think can be replicated in a private firm or a big firm setting. Um, and uh, while you may not get paid nearly as much, uh, you'll uh, have the experience to live your life um, more expansively in other areas. So that's what I would say. And along also, it's a payoff, right? Or it's a balance. So there, I'm not, you know, trying to besmirch big law firms, but every colleague I have that has gone to work for a big law firm, they were miserable and a lot of them left. And um, so they didn't have, they had to meet their billable hours and they didn't get to uh, litigate in court as much. They were doing a lot of memos. Hopefully they had good supervising attorneys, but sometimes those environments were toxic. I'm not trying to dissuade you from going there. I'm just saying it's, it is a place where you can make some money, but um, people at the AG's office, they tend to have, dare I say, I, I would submit to you that they may have a higher overall quality of life. You guys can correct me if you think I'm wrong. Completely agreed. <laughs> and I just, I just want to jump in and sort of sell, talk quickly about how our office is hiring. So diversity, equity, and inclusion is truly top of mind in everything that we do across the office. And so we have switched how we do our hiring to a, a very intentional competency based model. So when we're reviewing applications, we've got a set of competencies that we're looking for. And those might include things like communication skills, leadership skills, initiative. Um, now, one of, those, one of those categories is also GPA and grade improvement. So again, grades are only one of the six or seven competency, competencies that we're looking at. But we look, again, in that category, it's grades or grade improvement. So if someone had a really tough first year for whatever reason or a tough second year, but they can show us, hey, look, I've worked really hard at this and I'm improving. Well, then that speaks volumes about who they are and what they're gonna bring to our office. So you're not getting knocked for that at all. So if you're concerned about that, uh, go ahead and apply. I always think it's helpful to say, to say in your cover letter, while you may notice that in first year, I really struggled with my grades. You'll also see that in second and third year, you know, this is what it looked like, or that my strengths are continually in legal writing and clinical courses, or, you know, help us see that. And that's going to speak volumes. Um, but that's really how we do our hiring and, and we don't want that to be a secret. So if anyone's got more questions about what we look at and how we may look at your application or something you're worried about, don't hesitate to reach out. Excellent. And we will be dropping everyone's email addresses in the chat. Our speakers have very graciously offered to, um, you know, connect with you offline. If you have questions, you want to follow up with them. Um, and we are very grateful for that. Um, the, uh, there, Tate mentioned this question in the chat about, um, or in the Q&A box, um, about the best ways to prepare for a lateral move from a law firm to an AG's office. Um, are, is there a particular background or type of work that uh, an attorney working in a, in a big law firm could, could bring or, or show on their resume or the writing sample that um, you would like to see um, from a lateral hire? My vast years, two years experience, I'll try to do my best here. Um, you know, uh, I think something that we look for when we're going over candidates' resumes um, is that we look for someone with litigation experience, um, someone that has, um, you know, done the civil, um, you know, pretrial work in the past and has been in the courtroom. Um, those are both very important uh, in the Consumer Protection Division. 
you know, you can apply what you've learned in many practices of law to consumer protection. Um, as long as you, because every case is so different, as long as you know how to uh, build a case, uh, investigate a case, and then um, litigate a case, uh, you should be able to apply that. Antitrust is a little more specific. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd say having antitrust back, background there is, is, is important. Um, but, you know, something I, I realized I didn't answer in the last question uh, was what courses you can take during law school. Um, and I would say that uh, advanced appellate advocacy, if you have a, an opportunity to take that, or a complex litigation class, um, those are both very important. Uh, I think um, civil pretrial or um, always evidence always comes up. So, uh, you know, being able to practice or incorporate the rules of uh, civil procedure as well. Um, just those core classes are important, but the, I'd say the more high level writing and uh, advocacy courses really help and go a long way. And for lateral lawyers in our office, um, we are again looking for people with that core litigation skill set. But I think often subject matter is less important. We recognize that a lot of the work we do, and this is going to go for CJ and for Tate's office as well, but you won't necessarily have done before unless you've already worked in a state attorney general's office. So that's okay. Um, I think the core skills that you might get elsewhere are what we're really looking at um, because then we can, uh, you know, we can help train you and, um, give you the other subject matter expertise through work that you're doing on the ground um, to get that experience. We love hiring people uh, with experience coming from the private sector. It's great. And there's just some things when you're a litigator that trying to think of specifics, but there's just things that you know, things you're used to, ways you're used to, you know, um, dealing with opposing counsel, discovery, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, when you're uh, depositions, you know, just there's a lot of technical, logistical things you learn as a litigator in private sector and uh, those will serve you well at the AG's offices too. That's excellent. I'm going to ask one more question <laughs> before we close. I have a million that I could ask, but um, uh, do you have advice for students or lawyers um, whose current circumstances may lead to a gap in their resume? Um, and, and is there anything that lawyers or law students could do during that gap to um, you know, make their application stronger? Sure, I'm happy to um, just address this. You know, it's important to me because I was one of those people that had gaps in my resume. Um, you know, I took two years off before college, you know, tried my hand in acting, didn't really enjoy it very much in the uh, practical aspect. Uh, so, but as long as you address those in your resume or your cover letter, um, you know, it, it shows you have character and that you've gotten life experience outside of, of the classroom, which in some ways can be even seen as a positive, you know, a, a benefit for you, um, something that sets you apart. Uh, in addition to that, um, you know, I was going to start uh, my fall semester of law school in 2015 uh, when my mom had a double knee replacement and they broke her femur. Um, so she needed someone to live in with her um, full time. So I would take care of her during the day and then drive Uber at night to make some money um, for about six months. And then I did six months working in a law firm and had just deferred my um, you know, my admittance to UT Law uh, by a year. But I think that's also something that gave me uh, some insight into, you know, uh, working at a law firm was not exactly, uh, I don't think I was best suited for that. I think doing public service was, was what I was drawn to do. And I thought that going in, but, um, you know, doing something that keeps your mind active um, and, uh, it, you know, just trying to prepare yourself for your, your future career, um, I think is probably my best advice, but definitely um, don't, leave those, don't leave those gaps undisclosed or um, not, not spoken of in your resume or your application because then you leave it to the imagination of the person reviewing the application. And it's always better for you to talk about it and bring it up um, than it, you know, 
left to the imagination, someone just think you went on vacation for a year or something. So, uh, and there's nothing wrong with backpacking or going on a trip either. That's that's good life experience that I wish I had more of. So, um, it's always fun to talk about in an interview. And, and those gaps, that's kind of a trigger for me in the sense of, as a woman, you'll have some people that may have to take time off or, or want to take time off to raise children, even men these days, to raise their children or to care for an ailing parent or a number of life circumstances. So I agree with Tate that um, don't you know address them in your resume. If it's a personal situation, like an ailing parent or something, I'm, I'd have to put some thought into how you would word that in your resume because you don't necessarily want to open the door to um, maybe Karen has some ideas. You don't necessarily want to open the door to your private information, but I think that gaps, you have to go with the flow of life, right? And it's almost a sort of a, a the sexist kind of patriarchal system that doesn't allow for gaps. And so, um, so embrace them, embrace life, and don't be afraid to put them in. I think gaps aren't as bad as multiple short-term jobs, like job hopping. That looks worse to me on a resume than a gap. A, a well-explained gap doesn't bother me. There may be other people who feel other ways, but definitely doesn't bother me. This, the hopping, job hopping can be concerning. Yeah, so I'd agree with all of that. And I think the cover letter really is the place to, to tackle anything that you're sort of feeling uncomfortable about, um, whether it be a gap or if you were job hopping and there's a really good reason for it, you know, then then one line in your cover letter that explains that. Um, and I don't think you have to get too personal. Like, I think it's okay to say, even so if the issue was that you were taking care of a family member that had a, a real health condition or was an aged parent or something, I think you can say in a, in one sentence, you'll notice that in 2018, there's a gap on my resume. I was taking care of an aging parent, boom, like that without any other detail, I think that's okay. Um, and frankly, no apologies. You don't need to be sorry for who you are or what's gone on in your life. You're all doing incredible things and you all have a lot on your plate. So. So no apologies, don't feel shy about it. Don't worry about going into an interview. Are they gonna ask me about that? Again, you can have your one sentence for how you address that. And then you move forward and tie it into whatever it is you're, you're doing here today. You know, why you're interested in the position or what you want to do. Um, but don't feel like you need to apologize for who you are. And I mentioned before that for us, um, and I know these other offices, diversity, equity, and inclusion is really important. And so that means that we are looking for people with different life experiences that can bring value to our office. So not everyone's going to have the same resume. And we see that as a positive. Those are all very excellent pieces of advice. Thank you so much, Karen, CJ, Tate, for joining us today for this really robust discussion about working in a state AG office for the summer and beyond. Um, they, like I said earlier, they have graciously offered to connect with our viewers offline um, and their email addresses are in the chat. You should also feel free to contact me, vnannery at acslaw.org um, for more information, um, advice about state AGO jobs and opportunities. Um, we can help guide you um, on this path as well. And as I mentioned at the top of this um, webinar, we have career resources on our website for both summer and postgraduate opportunities in state AG offices. And we're happy um, to answer your questions. We are grateful that you could all join us today. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon and, um, and a great weekend. Bye, everyone. Thank you.